welcome to this morning, to this day, and to this opportunity to be together in community, which is a time of joy, comfort, and sometimes challenges. People's Unitary Universalist Congregation is a place where we come to learn more about being human. People's Unitarian Congregation, <clears throat> excuse me, we are, not, we are not here because we figured out life's questions or because we think we've got it right. We come here to learn more about being in relationship together, how to listen, how to forgive, how to think we've got it right. How to be vulnerable and how to create trust and compassion in one another. My name is Becky Moffat Moore and I'm from the Sunday Services Committee. I would like to extend a welcome to everyone gathered here this morning, though we are spread afar, whether you're new or a regular at People's Church. To those of you who are visitors to our service or here for the first time, thank you for being with us today. Now let us move into worship, willing to be authentic with each other, honest within ourselves, and open to connection in all its forms. If you're lighting a chalice at home, you are encouraged to type in the chat box, a chalice has been lit in your neighborhood, your city, your street. Fire consumes and casts a bright light. May our chalice flame consume our regrets for the past, our fears about the future, and our worries about today. May it light for us a path of joy, and peace as we rekindle old relationships and establish new. Joys and sorrows. People's people support one another in life, in good times and in difficult times. One of the ways we do this is by taking time out in the service to share important personal milestones and changes impacting our lives whether joyful or sorrowful. If you have a personal issue you wish to share, enter it along with your name in the chat box and I will read it and place a stone in the bowl. The mixing ripples of water signify how we are all interconnected. You may also ask that a stone be placed in the bowl without making a statement. I will pause the service recording now to maintain privacy. I will now place extra stones for the joys and the sorrows that remain unspoken.
Sources of reason and radiance, sources of courage and compassion. Keep watch over those who work or watch or weep this day. May the suffering be soothed. May the weary find rest. May the sick be tended. May the dying and those who love them find peace. May the joyous be shielded. And may all of us know that we are all wrapped in a love that surrounds us always, a web that connects us to all that exists. To prepare yourself for meditation, I ask that you sit comfortably with your feet on the floor and no body parts crossed. Take long, steady, deep breaths. Release worries and anxieties. Let yourself be fully present. Slowly, as you are ready, become aware of your surroundings and know that you are encompassed by love. For the offering, I'm reading an excerpt from A Greater Good for Ourselves and Our World by Kayla Parker. We know that our financial contributions to this congregation come from sacrifice and hard work. We are so grateful for this and commit together to ensure the funds we gather collectively to do a greater good for ourselves and our world than they could have done alone. May there be an offering to sustain and grow the life and mission of this congregation. May we give in love and in hope. To support the good important work of People's Church, go to the link in the chat box. Now for our offertory. I reach out to you, will you reach out to me? With all of our voices and all of our visions, sisters, we can make such sweet harmony. Building bridges between our divisions, I reach out to you, will you reach out to me? With all of our voices and all of our visions, sisters, we can make such sweet harmony. Building bridges between our divisions, I reach out to you, reach out to me. With all of our voices and all of our visions, sisters, we can make such sweet harmony. Building bridges between our divisions, I reach out to you, reach out to me. With all of our voices and all of our visions, sisters, we can make such sweet harmony. Sisters, we can make such sweet harmony. Building bridges between Building our divisions, between I reach, our out, divisions. To you, I reach out, out to you, will you reach out to me? With all of our voices and all of our visions, sisters, we can make such sweet harmony. Building bridges between our divisions, I reach out to you, will you reach out to me? With all of our voices and all of our visions, sisters, we can make such sweet harmony. Sisters, we can make such sweet harmony. Sisters, we can make such sisters, we can make such sweet harmony. Sisters, we can make such sweet harmony. Sisters, we can make such sweet harmony. Sisters, we can make such 
sweet harmony. Sisters, we can make such sweet harmony. Giving thanks to all that sustains us, please say with me, for the countless gifts we each have been given, gifts of life and love and sustenance, we bring these small portions to share in the works of love, which none of us can accomplish alone. I'd like to introduce our presenter today. Rebecca Sharp is a practicing obstetrician gynecologist and the director of OBGYN, OBGYN residency training program at WMU. She has been a member of Peoples since 2018. She has participated in choir, bell choir, and RE with the OWL program. She is married to Brandon Brown. Take it away, Rebecca. Thank you. I'm going to start my uh, time with some um, testimonials uh, from other writers. So the first is called How COVID-19 Tested My Relationship and Made It Stronger, written by Hannah Sacker, a senior at George Washington University in the February 11, 2021 issue of the Hatchet Student Paper. When the university first sent us home in March of last year, I knew my girlfriend and I would likely not be able to see each other until maybe the summer. But as cases soared and COVID anxiety weighed heavier, summer turned to fall and fall to winter. Before I knew it, we were nearly a year into our relationship with just four months of it having been spent in person. What helped us hold on to our relationship was not just love or sheer willpower, it was communication. It's a cliche to say that absence makes the heart grow fonder. In our case, it did, but it didn't do so on its own. When the only way for you to be with your partner is through phone or computer screen, it's absolutely necessary that you learn to communicate with them. It takes a lot of work, vulnerability, tears, time, understanding, and constant conversation. Wanting to be with someone can only get you so far especially during a pandemic. 
You have to put in the legwork, show up every day and show your significant other that you are in this relationship to win it, even when it seems like the world is ending. If you would not be able to last nine months or a year apart, you have to ask yourself the serious question, why are you in this relationship in the first place? And for the sake of communication, you need to ask your partner that too. College relationships are sometimes looked down upon or scoffed at, but during an especially uncertain time, I do know one thing. Our relationship was made stronger from our time apart and will grow even stronger from our time together. All it takes is communication. The next piece is called On Witness and Despair, A Personal Tragedy Followed by a Pandemic. It was written by Jessamine Ward and appeared in Vanity Fair in September of 2020. My beloved died in January. He was a foot taller than me and had large, beautiful, dark eyes and dexterous, kind hands. He fixed me breakfast and pots of loose leaf tea every morning. He cried at both of our children's births, silently, tears blazing his face. Before I drove our children to school in the pale dawn light, he would dance in the driveway to make the kids laugh. He was funny, quick-witted, and could inspire the kind of laughter that cramped my whole torso. In January 2020, we all became ill with what we thought was flu. Five days into our illness, we went to a local urgent care center where the doctor swabbed us and listened to our chest. The kids and I were diagnosed with flu. My beloved's test was inconclusive. At home, I doled out medicine to all of us, Tamiflu, Promethazine. My children and I immediately began to feel better, but my beloved did not. He burned with fever. He slept and woke to complain that he thought the medicine wasn't working. He was in pain. He took more medicine and slept again. Two days after our family doctor visit, I walked into my son's room where my beloved lay, panting, panting breathe. Within 15 hours of walking into the emergency room of the hospital, he was dead. The official reason, acute respiratory distress syndrome. He was 33 years old. I sank into hot, wordless grief. The absence of my beloved echoed in every room of our house. Him folding me and the children in his arms on our monstrous fake suede sofa. Him shredding chicken for enchiladas in the kitchen. Him holding our daughter by the hands and pulling her upwards higher and higher so she floated at the top of her leap in a long bed jumping marathon. During the pandemic, I couldn't bring myself to leave the house. Terrified, I would find myself standing in the doorway of an ICU room, watching the doctors press their whole weight on the chest of my mother, my sister, my children. Terrified of the lurch of their feet that accompanies each press that restarts the heart the jerk of the pale, tender soul. When my beloved died, a doctor told me, the last sense to go is hearing. When someone is dying, they lose sight and smell and taste and touch. They even forget who they are, but in the end, they hear you. You say, I love you. We love you. We ain't going nowhere. When I was first approached to be a speaker at a summer service last fall, I was asked if I would talk to you about the Our Whole Lives program. Otherwise known by the acronym of OWL, this is a sexuality education curriculum developed jointly with the Unitarian Universalist Association and the United Church of Christ. It was first published in 1999 and has been updated a few times since then. There are six different sets of curricula for age groups ranging from kindergarten to older adults. The middle and high school curriculum in which I am trained takes a more, much more personal angle than the traditional school-based sex ed classes that are offered at the same ages. There's time built in for discussion, games, and activities. In each session, the youth are given an opportunity to put anonymous questions in a box, a chance to ask those questions that might not come up when surrounded by random kids from school. The OWL curriculum only spends about one third of the lessons on the traditional topics from health class, like anatomy, physiology, contraception, sexually transmitted infections. The other lessons focus on values clarification, building healthy relationships, and communication. Some of the workshop titles included verbal and nonverbal communication, what makes a good relationship, 
images of love and sex and music and video, recognizing unhealthy relationships and breaking up and moving on. Luckily, I was accompanied by uh, people trained in psychology and other disciplines because uh, while I learned a lot about the traditional health class topics in medical school, they didn't teach me quite as much about communication. Um, being taught outside of the school system, OWL does not need to conform to state or federal uh, limitations or have their agendas. Um, we have a spirituality in our faith companion to the program that brings the focus onto Unitarian Universalist principles. They make suggestions surrounding uh, opening and closing rituals and words uh, to deepen the discussion when the program is being used in a church setting. And there's a similar uh, set of things for the uh, United Church of Christ participants. OWL imparts an outlook that is strikingly absent from today's health class. Sexuality is not something to be ashamed of, hidden, or feared. It is something to be questioned and explored respected and protected. It's a nuanced, complex, and essential part of the human experience for our whole lives. I was approached by Diane Melvin when as a new member, I uh, introduced myself to the congregation and listed my occupation as an OBGYN. As it happened, uh, I joined the congregation just prior to People's Church hosting teaching training for OWL. That teacher training was very interesting to me. It was one of my first experiences outside of just Sunday services as a new um, uh, participant to UU. I was still learning the seven principles. I didn't even know the words to blue boat home yet. Uh, and the rituals that are familiar to all of you, such as uh, creating a group covenant, talking about roses and thorns, and um, step up, step back concepts that the youth uh, will use, these were all new to me. Uh, with this new training, uh, I was then put to work teaching 11th and 12th grade youth during the fall of 2019. And there was a great group who participated um, in these classes. And there were, we had some great discussions. There were sometimes challenging topics. Um, and I, I saw the maturity and thoughtfulness of the youth that had been raised in this church and was just impressed again with the uniqueness of this beloved community that I had um, so recently become a part. Um, we talked a lot about some of the parts of the curriculum that are a little bit outdated. There's a lot of reference to gender binary that doesn't really hold up in today's um, thinking about those topics. Um, and I just constantly marveled at how different this was than I remembered my experience in um, quote unquote sex ed in school and health class. And, and really how much better prepared I hope that these youth were going to be to go out into the adult world of relationships. And of course, we finished the course and we were getting ready to start a different curriculum when the pandemic hit us in March of 2020. Uh, unlike the stories that I shared with you in the beginning of this, my personal pandemic story is pretty benign. Um, as a doctor, I was, of course, what we started to call an essential worker. I remained at my job um, with a few adjustments. Office work actually halted for a time while we all got our crash course in telehealth and talking to patients by video and phone and how to document all that. Um, elective surgeries were put on hold, but babies wait for no one, even a pandemic. Um, I have the dubious distinction of performing one of the first C-section deliveries of a patient who was infected with COVID at Bronson Hospital. Just so you know, that patient recovered fully and the baby is healthy. Um, so my regular routine with a lot more mask wearing and contact precautions than I was used to um, resumed a lot sooner than most people. My husband, Brandon, works in IT. He was already working part-time from home, so transitioning to doing that full-time was not super difficult. And in fact, at first it was positive since it meant that he no longer had to commute to Ann Arbor every few weeks, um, as we had been doing. But the longer we had to be separated from our family and friends outside of work hours, it got harder and harder. We have family and friends scattered across Michigan and the country. Um, so while Brandon and I tend to be pretty introverted ourselves at baseline, um, an enforced separation started to take a toll on our moods and um, was really challenging. For the youth that we taught last year, I saw the impact of lost connections and lost moments. It can't be understated all of the things that were different for them. They lost the chance to walk the graduation stage in the cap and gown, go to their senior prom, participate in all the other senior shenanigans. Um, some of the youth had to start their college careers instead of learning to live with new roommates away from home for the first time. They were 
uh, isolated in their childhood rooms taking virtual classes on Zoom uh, away from their fellow students. All of us dealt with Zoom all of the time, from school gatherings to family gatherings to, of course, our church services. The youth continued to gather on Zoom through the summer and into the fall, and um, I participated and ended up pulling Brandon into that with me. Um, it wasn't easy to make connections through the computer screens, but we did our best. We came up with some interesting games and um, activities uh, that and worked through um, some really interesting um, exercises about mindfulness and meditation with, with um, the curriculum that Diane had started. As we moved into the winter, we decided to bring the group together um, for masked socially distanced bonfires and seeing how everyone was so excited to stand around even though it was freezing cold and just to be able to talk in person was honestly one of the moments that really brought home to me the isolation that COVID had created for everyone. And I was going to talk to you, I had big plans to talk about oxytocin and bonding hormones and things like that today. But at the end of the day, you all know how difficult it has been for everyone in the past year, um, no matter what the hormonal basis of that is, human beings need to be together. <laughs> in the past, none of us talked about social distancing, masking, or any other um, pandemic control topics, but those have become second nature to all of us now. In the past, a presentation of the basic anatomy and a little information about contraception and diseases was thought to be sufficient sexuality education to prepare the young people for the complex world of intimate relationships among adults. And I, I like to think of OWL as the future. I hope that um, the discussions that we did in the OWL program will be enough to prepare the youth to think critically and creatively, not just about intimate relationships, but all of their relationships um, in what I hope we will soon be calling the post-pandemic world. So guidelines for discussion this morning, please speak the truth as you understand it. To avoid inhibiting the flow of discussion, do not comment on others' comments until everyone has had a chance to do the initial sharing. The questions are in the chat box, but I will repeat them for those who do not ac have access to the chat box. First question, what was your experience learning about relationships when you were a youth? What do you wish someone had taught you? What lessons has COVID-19 taught you about relationships? And how will your relationships change as social distancing restrictions are removed? AV will now divide us into groups for discussion.
I've been asked to give a short announcement before closing. The Electric Vehicle Eco Forum meeting is at one o'clock today at the church. Closing words, be true, be well, be loving by Cynthia Landrum. We leave this gathered community, but we don't leave our connection, our concerns, our care for each other, our service to each other, to the world, and to our faith continues. Until we are together again, friends, be strong, be well, be true, be loving. People who wish to participate in a virtual coffee hour are invited to stay for smaller group conversations. Have a wonderful week.